This is Creating Your Encore Career and Becoming a Silver Entrepreneur with your host, Lynn Freest. Lynn will share ideas and expert advice from people that are walking in your shoes and living their encore careers, where they want and at the pace they want. You'll start a company of one with confidence and knowledge to live a fulfilled life of freedom and ease. Lynn is a coach and leadership consultant whose mission is to show senior leaders and experts how to start something refreshing and new after a full career in the corporate environment. Welcome to this episode of Creating Your Encore Career and Becoming a Silver Entrepreneur. Thanks for listening. With an encore career, the rewards are better than a cold beer on a hot day. And you can be creating value in the world beyond just winning that next pickleball game. You can work when you want, where you want, and you can do the work you love. You can live the dream. If you're ready to get started today, contact me at lynn at lynnfreas.com. Today, this is episode 191, and it's Push Hard and Stay Playful, an interview with Jason Seastick. Jason's a U.S. Army veteran, a coach, an entrepreneur, and what he calls a dynasty builder. He's a father, a husband, a fighter, and a carrier of heavy things. He, he, for entertainment, he goes on long hikes to the sand dunes carrying a 40-pound rucksack. So, again, he's got some drive and determination. Jason's company, Spear & Clover, helps entrepreneurs who have gotten as far as they can by themselves. They've put in the hard work, overcome obstacles, and learned how to wear all the hats, yet still can't seem to take it to the next level. So he helps them create what he calls a dynasty organization, which is about them and around them, but it's not reliant on them individually. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about Jason's journey from the military to corporate banking to now entrepreneurship. Jason will share his story of how he found his core values and the meaning behind his website, Spear and Clover. He will also share how he helps people build a business that's scalable, and it could be sold if success comes knocking. And finally, we'll discuss the importance of having a purpose and maintaining a spirit of curiosity throughout your life. Well, welcome, Jason. It's great to have you on the podcast. Looking forward to our conversation. And just to start with, got any interesting projects or things you're working on right now? Lynn, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I am really excited to have a conversation with you, as well as I appreciate you sharing your audience with me today. Yeah, I'm actually... Uh, I'm like knee deep into trying something totally new for me that I've really never wanted to be, I never thought I wanted to be involved in. And it's out of necessity. And that is social media, even podcasting. I never, when I left corporate America, I really thought that I would spend my time developing and building communities and tribes at a local level to help people improve their lives. And as that lens has shifted and scaled, now I find myself needing to do things like this. And I can tell you that having been someone who never wanted to do it, I have found it to be very challenging and very rewarding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll bet. It's, as I talk with folks like myself who have left corporate America, we do have mastery over things, but we have to be willing to be an apprentice and some other things where we don't have those skills yet. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That really resonates with me, Glenn, for sure. So, uh Tell us some more about your business your, and your journey. You've got a very interesting one. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a winding path for me, but I think once I explain it, I think you can understand the connective, the connective tissue. So uh, coming out of school, I went into the United States military, as so many young men and women do, when they have all the energy in the world and no discipline or focus, which was certainly me. And I had a, it was the best thing I ever did. I, I learned how to work hard. I learned how to do things I didn't want to do. I learned how to be a part of a very cohesive and elite team, in my opinion. But four years in a day would have been too much, Lynn. So getting out at four years was the exact right time for me. And when I got out of the military, I did two things. I went to school for finance and eventually became a banker, one of the bigger banks. And I also, at the same exact time, started a small CrossFit gym on the dusty fourth floor of this old, almost abandoned warehouse in Chicago with two other veterans. And the path was, it was an interesting one. I thought my whole world was laid out ahead of me in this corporate world and we'll just do the thing we love on the side. And very quickly, I realized that serving two masters was ultimately making me mediocre at both. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until I decided to combine my, my military mindset, which is one of my core values, and it's the spear and my personal brand, 
my military mindset was going towards finance and my spirit of the puppy, which is the other half of me, was going towards the gym. And it wasn't until I combined those two things that I found success in building a community and building a real capital B business that could support myself and really provide an unbelievable value for people. Um, And then, of course, as so many people do, I found success being a brick and mortar gym owner. I ended up helping brick and mortar gym owners to grow their businesses, specifically through COVID, as, which was super hard time for our industry. And then I realized that the things I was teaching these folks really weren't anything to do with weights or sets or nutrition or any of that stuff. It was all about having an undeniable offer, being able to, to market, generate leads, and then sell those leads, and then build a team using SOPs and training, et cetera. And so really, this just was business. And so through a circuitous path, I find myself a coach of entrepreneurs, specifically coaches, consultants, and solopreneurs. Sounds great. And it's interesting, like you say, it's always a growing and sometimes the path wanders around a little bit. I can appreciate that. Yeah. The two things that have always connected me where I've felt well in in my surroundings, Lynn, were number one, that I was super passionate about the thing that I was doing. So when I was a kid, I worked at the snowboarding hill because I loved snowboarding and I worked at the shop because I loved cars and I worked at the mall because I loved, I wanted nice clothes or whatever. And it's no different now. I, when I got out of the military, I was flipping bikes on Craigslist. That was my first little jobby. And then it was a gym and now it's coaching other entrepreneurs. But the other thing is community and tribe and bringing people together. Because for me, I want to go anywhere if I'm going alone. I want to go with people that are, that have a similar mindset that are trying to get out there and really build something together. That's really the exciting thing for me. And so now I try to help people to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And for my audience, often as you leave corporate America, you, in a sense, kind of leave your friends behind or your network or whatever it may be. And so that's one of the things that I try to help people. I want to coach people in groups or have peer groups because you really have to, uh, you have to go together, as you say. And when I've been involved in peer groups, I learned as much from my colleagues as I did from the facilitator or whoever it may be. So I wanted that offer that same thing to other people who are, can be lonely being an entrepreneur. (laughs) Yeah. My friend, Scott Ferguson said, and I've adopted this on even my website, but my friend, Scott Ferguson once told me it's the plus equals minus model of personal growth. It's plus having a mentor at all times, somebody that you look up to that's further down the path than you equals having peers like a mastermind or a group like you're talking about. And then actually minus, this is the one I think most people slip up on, is reaching behind you and helping that generation behind you to ascend Mm -hmm. along the path to where you've already been. And what I've found, Lynn, is that to know something is knowledge. If I understand something from one direction is knowledge, but as soon as I start to teach it, I have to be able to understand it from so many different angles. And I think that's the building blocks of wisdom. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. certainly then in my career, I never learned anything quite as well as when I had to teach it. (laughs) Truer words have never been said. (laughs) And I think, again, that's one of the values that, again, this Encore Career Group, we can provide to people is that we've seen a lot of bumps in the road. We've made a lot of mistakes. We can help other people either avoid them or know how to recover from them. So Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things we offer to people if we're in that next chapter in life. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, Jason, you do a lot of interesting stuff. So I'm looking on your website, you're hiking with 40 pounds on your back and 40 pounds yeah. in your arms. What does that give you in life? <laughs> so that's a military thing. So it's called ruck marching. But for those folks that weren't in the military, they call it hiking. And I live here in the Indiana Dunes National Park outside of Chicago by about an hour. And so I have these rolling sand dunes, which unfortunately remind me of where I spent some time in the military. And so I'll take my two Australian shepherds on ruck marches, usually with some folks that come along with me sometimes as a solo mission. Yeah. And I like to ruck through the dunes. I use a 40 pound pack on my shoulder and occasionally, and on the website I talk about when I came up with my brand, the Spear and Clover was carrying a 40 pound log on my shoulder. And it's funny just to address that, the idea behind it, I call it the alpha log. (laughs) And I found it. I found that log the day that I came up with this, which I'll tell the story for this in a moment, the Spear and Clover symbol. And the idea behind it is this. If I'm wearing a 40-pound pack and I'm carrying a 40-pound log on my shoulder, if I make that normal to where I don't complain about it, I don't even notice that it's there, then maybe I'm qualified to lead other people, to help them pay their mortgages, to have them look to me for guidance. Maybe if I'm capable of carrying that kind of burden myself without it feeling like much of an effort, then maybe I'm ready to do that and take on those responsibilities in my professional life. And I've found that to be a pretty connected corollary. Yeah, absolutely. Let's hear about the Spear and Clover. 
yeah, I'm somebody, and I help people do this professionally, but I'm somebody whose life was changed when it was advised to me by one of my closest friends and a mentor who's very successful. He said, listen, man, I know you, when you filed your LLC, you filled out your mission statement and your core values. But looking at him, it really looks like it was Steve Jobs that filled those out because he borrowed them from Apple. And maybe it was Elon Musk because he borrowed them from Tesla. And like so many entrepreneurs before me, I was told what I needed to do. And so I did the easiest way to do it. And I just wrote it down. My mission statement is I'm going to do this. And my core values are like, never give up and grow or die. And like all these things that you've heard a million times. It wasn't until my close friend and mentor told me, hey, man, your core values are really the embers that are inside of you already. They're not who you wish you were. That's not, they're not who you admire. They're who you showed up as. They're why you are who you are. Because ultimately for you to be successful, you're going to have to be an authentic version, maybe at the best expression of that authentic version of yourself. And so when I really, what changed my life was really understanding my core values and taking the time to do that. And so two of those core values describe me as a person. One is spirit of the puppy. I was born with this. I'm spirit of the puppy means I'm high energy. I love to meet new people. When I get on a call, it's like this. If you walked into my gym back in the day and I was in the very back, I would run to the front. Hey, how you doing? And if I knew you, I'd give you a big hug. That was great. And I, I was born with that. It wasn't until I joined the United States Army that I got my second core value, which is military mindset. So that's discipline and hard work and showing up for the people that are expect that are relying on you and never li- leaving anybody behind and these types of ideas. And so it's the combination of those two things that really make me who I am. And it makes me, it makes the people that I have enjoyed being around and spending my time with who they are in some way or another as well. And so the story of the spear and clover, which represents those two sim- those two ideas, was one day when I found that log, I was rucking 11 miles. I had a 40-pound pack on my back and a 40-pound log on my shoulder, and I had my two Australian shepherds who were very much attached to my hip figuratively. And so I'm laser-focused on my goal. I'm military mindset. I got a log on my shoulder. I'm not putting it down for 11 miles. And the dogs are having the time of their life, Lynn. They're running out into the woods, and then they're good girls, so they come back and check on me. And then they run out into the woods, and then they come back and check on me. And it just occurred to me in that instant that at my best, that's how I go through life. It's not just laser focused on working hard and achieving big, hairy goals, but it's also taking the time to try new things and meet new people and show love to the people in my life that I love and I enjoy spending time with. And now that has blossomed into sort of a way of life. And we even have the Spear and Clover mastermind, which is Mm -hmm. predicated on the idea of pursuing equally, you know, business success, personal and professional success, social and family harmony and inner Harmony, I guess. Sure. And I, I think that's an interesting piece, especially for, again, the audience, my audience, as they leave corporate life, often we've been focused on the hamster wheel of success. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, we'd like to have some significance, but also we'd like to have some joy in life, too. So I love your spear and clover you know, metaphor, because not only do we want to continue doing something in this next chapter of life, but hey, let's make sure we're enjoying the people around us as we do it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So what do you find, I'm curious about the people that listen to the show and the people that you serve, what do you find they most need leaving a long-term corporate world and trying to start the next leg of their journey? I think it's one, obviously it's a mindset shift. So this Mm -hmm. whole idea of the um, corporate world, you've got habits, routines, a lot of structure, And then all of a sudden, the good news is you can do anything you want. The bad news is you can do anything you want. And so a couple of things. One is to, how do we create some new structure in this next chapter that will be useful for us? But then it's also, how do I uh, present myself as both a master? In most cases, they have experience there that they can share with people. So you don't want to discount that. But on the other hand, can they also be an apprentice? So whether it be podcasting or any number of other skills, even things like marketing, how do they both hold on to their mastery and then be an apprentice and learn new skills? So those two things, I think, are the ones that, you know, really, um, really define how they, some of the transition they make. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's really interesting, man. I'm really glad that you're out there helping these folks. Yeah. And in some cases, it's as simple as sometimes people say, hey, it's too simple. No. You just need new habits. Now, the other thing, why I like to do things with peer groups is you need a new group of friends, too. Again, the friends 
they've retired, either they've retired or they're not interested in it. Even your family may not understand what in the world are you doing here in this second chapter of life? Yeah. So you need some people that are on a common or a similar journey one way or the other. And I, that's what I've found to be true too, that I need some people around that are at least on the same similar paths with me. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard when you find yourself, I, I'm in a chat thread with a bunch of bankers that I used that I went to school with and had worked with. And it's, it's sometimes hard to connect because we're just in different universes now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, but it's one of those things where they, a lot of people, <laughs> I, I tease people sometimes that they start off by saying, I think I'll go learn pickleball or whatever it may be. And, but they get bored with that, quite frankly, mm-hmm. a lot of them. And I, a lot of my colleagues, when I retired, I went off trying to build a business and they were saying, that sounds good, but Sounds pretty hard, and uh, but I knew they were they had rich experiences that they could be sharing in the world, and so I thought maybe I can find a way to help go people go further and farther and faster in this journey of with a little help. That's great, man. I imagine I look at the trajectory that I was on, and certainly the elder statesmen and women of the very well respected organization I was a part of, and I imagine you become this scalpel, this like <laughs> surgical instrument. And I can tell you from the other side, if you're listening to this and you're not yet an entrepreneur, you'd, be, you'd rather be a dull multi-tool than a surgical scalpel when you start a business from scratch because there's just so many little things that the people that I help most, Lynn, are kind of different people, but very similar problem where I'm the best at this. And it's like, that's terrific, but nobody knows because mm-hmm. you're not marketing or you're not selling or you're not able to scale to a team. And so you can only help a few people or whatever it may be. I call those folks magicians. And it sounds like you're working with magicians too. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, in, again, checking on the work you're doing, it's always interesting because some of these, they like to, um, they have dreams if, even if they haven't gotten there yet of scaling. And I think you, uh, you've got some great frameworks where you talk about Okay, how do you go beyond yourself as the key driver of a business? And so I think maybe you could share a little bit about how you help people make that leap. Yeah, I do that. That's exactly what I do. And so it starts, as we've alluded to, it starts with the foundation. What is the business? What are the goals of the business? What's important to you? How do you want to energize those goals? This is things like mission, core values, goals. What is the offer? What is How are you demonstrating value and solving a really big problem for whoever it is you serve? That's the foundation. That's the bedrock of your business. But if we want to build a tall building, we need frameworks that are real material. And so if we imagine, I want want to be on the top of a mountain, I don't even, that doesn't excite me. What excites me is the scaffolding that you can create, that that you can even explain to me that says, oh, once we're on the top of the mountain, here's how we're going to get there. And here's how it's going to be stable. And our lives are going to be good. So often people have these goals and they don't really consider what their life would be like if they took what they're currently doing and just applied that much revenue of business to get done. They don't consider these frameworks that are scalable upward. And so what I do really, Lynn, is not sell answers as much as I sell great questions to make sure that we're planning and preparing something that you can add a lot more load than it currently has and not have it break. Because if we don't fix these problems when you're bored, we're sure as heck not going to be able to fix them when you're crazy busy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. And uh, again, I think people, there's an interesting, a guy I know who's about my age, he's about 70, uh, but he tells the story of his father who started a business at 95 and (laughs) scaled it to... Scaled it to a million dollars uh, at ninety-seven or something, and uh, oh come on! <laughs> so, I think That's were, my hero. That's they amazing. Were se- selling supplements or something, but anyway. But again, longer lives and stuff. Even at sixty, you can have two careers in front of you. So this whole idea of okay, I may want to be a solopreneur, but you know what? I may want to have a bigger impact than that. And so, take being able to take that step of going beyond what you could do individually, I think, is important. Or at least be aware of it. I think one of the things that my favorite book, I'll just say my favorite entrepreneur's book is called Built to Sell. And one thing about just a little point of that book was, look, even if you don't think you want to sell your business, build it as if you were, and you may find, you may find you want to sell it, but you may find it's really great to just run a business that doesn't stress you out and throws off cash every week. And so I love that idea of, hey, you want to be a solopreneur? That's great. Why on earth would you not build it in such a way that if success finds you and comes knocking, you're ready to energize it in such a way where it doesn't ruin your day-to-day life? Yeah. And plus, I think having done that, you can, um, again, if you find 
10 years down the road, you want to have a different pace in life, the business can still run, even though you're not laser focused on it as you were before. You can still stay in your zone of genius, as I as they say, but you won't have to be, quote, running the business quite as hard as you were. Yeah. And maybe to issue a challenge to somebody that's listening to this saying like, hey, man, I'm a, I was a data scientist for X many years, or I was an, an architect or whatever it is. And they are, I call them magicians for a reason. They are the mm-hmm. best at what they do. The challenge I would say to that person is if you're so damn good, why can't you teach people to do it for you in your, on your team? And because mm-hmm. that's the thing I think where people struggle is they go, I call it the beautiful butterfly paradox. It's I'm a unique, special butterfly. And I've spent this many years developing this skill set. And, and they're like, I can't hire anybody because why can't anybody do what I do? Well, there is because you need to teach them because you had to spend so much time developing this skill. You got to write it down. And so one of the things that I help people do is come up with the scaling of the SOPs, the roles. And a lot of times what you did becomes five people's roles at scale. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, again, the things is our entrepreneurs and senior entrepreneurs can do is give back. There's a lot of new talent coming on the scene in the world, and but they haven't had that experience yet. So how can we have a role somehow in, in developing new talent and sharing the expertise that we built over time? And so it's, I think that's another, again, that change from success or individual success to significance is not just how can I fix the problem, but how can I help somebody else learn to fix it? So success to significance is not just how do I solve the problem, but help somebody else to do it. That's really interesting. That's a powerful thought, man. Yeah, because, you know, it's a lot of those things. It's you, you want something that lives beyond you. It, as we get to that second stage of life, we think of start thinking of those things, legacy and stuff. Yeah. Well, I may have been the greatest data science in the world, but if I, I'm going to leave this world sometime, then if, does all that just disappear? Or does somebody get to carry it on? I was literally having this conversation with my mom the other day, talking about the idea that I can't think of her name. Gloria comes to mind. It's a female painter, 19th or 20th century, but she died having never released or sold a painting. Mm. I can't think of her names. People are screaming at their phones or car stereos or whatever right now. But but the idea being like, you can be the best at what you do, but if you can't show the world that and they don't recognize it, then, you know, that's actually your fault because mm-hmm. the world will acknowledge uh, virtue and truth mm-hmm. if you display it in the correct way. And so this is where, so this is maybe the thing that I've learned as an entrepreneur that I can share with your audience is you're going to get frustrated when they don't understand you. Mm -hmm. when they don't buy what you're selling because they don't understand it, even though it would help them. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get frustrated when you try to do something and it doesn't get the results you think and you know that it deserves. But you need to be willing, if you're going to enter down that path, to take ownership of clarifying your message in such a way that anybody can understand it. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe the most painful thing that I've ever had to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I often talk with people and uh, to get them started, I say, I want you to list down the activities you love doing or you've had great success doing. I says, I don't want to hear positions. I don't want to hear titles. I want to list in detail the activities. And then that's a place to where you're going to, because going out in the world, nobody wants to buy your position. Nobody wants, they want to solve their problems. So you have to be able to talk about how you can solve their problems, which is different than just saying, hey, I'm a vice president of logistics or something like that. Nobody cares. <laughs> yeah, it's, man, you and me, man, we should be friends. We are friends. That's it, man. <laughs> we're friends. The uh, The other day, I had a person tell me, and we were talking about sales, and he's one of the best sales coaches in the world that I'm aware of. And he was like, yeah, entrepreneurs a lot of times, and I think this applies to your folks, entrepreneurs a lot of times think of features because that's what we spend our whole life developing is features. Mm -hmm. And so it's, oh, I got my new certification. And so that means I can work with this equipment. And I got my new this, which means I can do that surgery or I learned how to work with this language. And so what we do when we try to market ourselves is we talk only in features or primarily in features. And in reality, this is when you're at the wedding or in the elevator or you meet somebody that you should be working with and they go, wow, it sounds like you're unbelievable. I don't know how I could use that. But if I ever bump into some miracle person who asks for these certifications and these procedures and this, that, and the other, when in fact, if you just took that extra time and took a slight shift in the lens that you're looking at it and looked instead 
from their perspective. Mm -hmm. Now you can really communicate the benefits to the client as opposed to just the features that you are able to deliver. Even those two things may very well be the same root cause or root Mm -hmm. thing. It's I'm still struggling to improve on that every single day. Yeah. And again, that probably comes from my background as a coach and stuff. I really focus on the questions, but I encourage people to, again, you're the expert, but you know what you really have to do is keep digging deeper on the questions with the person you think may need your help because mm-hmm. back in my old days of manufacturing, five time, ask why five times to drill down to that root cause. And it's important that... <clears throat> Again, you are the expert, but you need to really understand whatever the, the client's problem is. Yeah, I had a post a couple of weeks ago that was like, if I ask you what a person eats when they're hungry, you can only say food. <laughs> if I ask you what your friend eats when they're hungry, you can say, I think he likes Italian. Okay, mm-hmm. we're getting somewhere. And if you ask me, like, what does your daughter eat when she's hungry? She eats spaghetti, but she only eats it if she sees the noodle go in the pan. And she only will eat this certain brand of this. And then she has to be holding her baby shark doll and her little water bottle. And I have to put her in the certain cushions on the chair. That's, and we could go further, right? Mm -hmm. If I asked you what I eat, then I would even be more detailed. And so I agree that you can always dissect things by asking additional whys or continuing to ask questions. Yeah, and it's been interesting to me too as I've I've done some volunteer work helping young entrepreneurs that are trying out business ideas and stuff and that that whole idea of you really have to keep drilling down and and then it's sometimes it's the it's not the stated problem you, you'll find uh, somebody says well I don't have enough sales then <laughs> you keep asking and pretty yeah. soon it's that I don't have feel confident in selling things oh okay Different question, a few questions, but we got to more of a problem that's really in your way as opposed to something out in the world. It's really your ability or confidence in selling. I just couldn't possibly agree with you more. (laughs) As you have worked with a variety of people, any common success things that you found for the ones that really were able to make great strides moving forward or conversely, things that you found commonly hold people back? I think it's the inverse of the same thing. The number one thing is most people that are that I that either either that find themselves drawn to working with me or that I attract or however you would say that typically have shiny object syndrome, which is my default. And for your listeners who maybe have not heard that before, shiny object syndrome is this idea where when you're a visionary entrepreneur, or at least you see yourself as one, you learn how to come up with good ideas. And you see the world as it could be, and you can't help but take action. The problem is that's actually really easy to do. And so it's an itch that you can scratch many times. And so people will say, I'm going to start a mastermind, and I'm going to create a program, and then I'm going to write a book, and then I'm going to make a movie, and then I'm going to have a podcast. And then what is they do all of those things in 45 days, and you just see the beginnings of all these fine ideas. Um, And so the people that are not successful with me typically cannot stop that. And the people who are successful with me, fortunately, do. Because ultimately, I don't care. Honestly, I don't care if it's dog grooming or chat GPT. If you stick with one idea that you're passionate about and you focus on becoming undeniable and scalable, you will become valuable, which means you have the opportunity, if you're intelligent, to become wealthy. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I also suffer from the shiny object syndrome and (laughs) I'm a happy puppy with new ideas. And I really have to often drag myself back and say, wait a minute, is this the next most important thing you're supposed to do? (laughs) Yeah, truthfully, I find, though it's not my idea, Marcus Aurelius talks about this. There was a samurai, Mizugaki, I think. I'm not sure about that. The way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Mm -hmm. And the older I get, and I'm 40, but the older that I get, and I know that in 10 years, I will look back at this and laugh at myself now when... So you have, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> but the older I get, the more I realize that it really is the way that I treat the dishes and the way that I handle my daughter when she's upset is the same way that I handle everything. And so what I've found is if I borrow, if I try to borrow my goodness and only put it on my business and then let everything else fall apart, that falls apart too. And so mm-hmm. the only real way to do anything well is to try to just be better. And that starts with habits. It's not what you do today. It's what you do every day. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I like to, you mentioned Marcus Aurelius. I, I read a little thing from the Daily Stoic every day, and it yeah. always amazes me as I bump into these different things that it's, there's the same 
people issues from 2,000 years ago. Same. Technology same. may be different, but uh, as people, we're still bumping into the same things we always have. <laughs> I walk on a path out here. And when I do, sometimes I'm mentoring somebody. And I just realized that I'm walking on the same path that somebody many years ago was walking on mentoring somebody else. And that, even as I say that, I get a little choked up. Like that, there's a real walk that we're all on. And when mm -hmm. you realize that you're not in the front of it and you're not in the back of it mm -hmm. uh, and that you are in fact learning how to do it as best as you can. At the same time, you're trying to do it with the people that you care about that are your peers. And you also, if you're really lucky and you have the ability, can reach back and help to teach the people behind you how to do it right as well. I don't think that has anything to do with technology. I don't think it has anything to do with politics. I don't think it has to do with anything. I think that Marcus Aurelius is maybe the best example I'm aware of where there's something where you can read it and go, that happened in my office last week. <laughs> it's really direct. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention when uh, Philosophize This is a podcast that he just starts at pre-Socrates, Socrates. Oh. And, and every episode he goes forward and it's beautiful. Amazing. That yeah. sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> I always remember another quote that <clears throat> I think he had in there. It said, both Caesar and his mule driver were both buried in the same clay or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and, but still the, uh, I think this whole idea of both focus and being open to things that are new again, in the second chapter of life, sometimes we tend, we've done so many things for so long, it's sometimes hard to break free, but I think it's possible for any of us. If you, again, I try to encourage people, have an, a spirit of curiosity, you know, whatever you go into. I don't know how to do this yet, <laughs> but how can we learn how to do this? Or at some point you may decide, I'm not going to learn how to do that. I'll hire it done. Or, But the same idea, be curious as you move forward in life. And quite frankly, there's a book I read from a Harvard professor that if you maintain a spirit of curiosity, you can add seven and a half years to your life. It's an important thing for a lot of reasons. <laughs> yeah, I, I think having a purpose is huge. I think, too, that for your audience that maybe is trying to uh, listen, our, our, our flexibility, I feel it myself already a lot. Our flexibility reduces as we get set in our ways because there's comfort and there's experience and there's momentum and then like physiological changes, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where I would say if you do think that you want to start something and you want to try new things and you want to learn new things. I personally think of myself and I would recommend think of yourself as a shepherd of your attention span. Try to choose something that you already are interested in, that you already are excited about. Because I can tell you this, it's actually not that hard to learn marketing, but it's a lot harder if you're doing it for something you don't care about. And right. so if you if you make sure that you pick something that like it is so important that I get this message out to the world or that I get this thing or that I spend my time doing that or I create this procedure or whatever it is, the thing that's really important to you, if it's just a door that's in your way of learning marketing, you'll open the door. Mm -hmm. But if there's resistance that you can't overcome, it might be because you actually don't really want to. Mm -hmm. Oh, I agree. That whole idea of, I think, purpose is important. And I've been through a group called the Modern Elder Academy, and they have a big course around purpose because often people, again, having years in corporate America, they had a, quote, corporate purpose or whatever it was. Now, all mm -hmm. of a sudden, they've got freedom, but they have to figure out where is my energy going to go in the future and what is it? And another gentleman I know talks about the portfolio career. So this idea of you may not just have one thing moving forward, but you may have a couple of things that you do. Maybe there's a volunteer piece. Maybe there's a work for pay piece. Maybe there's just a hobby piece. But you can have different threads going forward. Uh, and actually, it's probably a good thing in all life not to have a singular purpose. You can get to, I think, tunnel vision with that. But that whole idea of where can we but follow what you think is certainly important, I think, is great advice. And thank you for that. Well, you know, I, I just... um. I, um, a lot of, a lot of the things that I would say on a podcast are things that I believe to be true, but they're not unique to me. And because the things that are unique to me usually either can be traced back to somebody else smart that said them, or I haven't figured out why they're wrong yet. And so a lot of the things I'm talking about, I've learned from other people like yourself and from people like Marcus Aurelius and from people like other podcasters or books or mentors, peers. I, uh, I, I have str I am definitely someone who believes in in I don't know if I would say becoming lifting yourself up by your bootstraps, but I'm certainly somebody who believes that your life will be what you make of it. But I'm also somebody who is really seeing more and more how much you know 
all of our knowledge is like a collection of you take one idea that you like, you take another idea you like, I like this guy, I like her ideas. And then maybe you can synthesize those two things into a unique point of view. That's what I think it's all about for me right now is trying to find, okay, so it's it's questions. So Mm -hmm. Marcus Aurelius was right. And Emmanuel, Emmanuel Kant was right. Well, Okay, but they don't totally agree. So like, where's the third path? And I don't mm-hmm. actually, don't quote me on that crappy <laughs> analogy, but you get my idea. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and as a, again, as friend has told me, the world needs your voice. Maybe not everybody in the world, but somebody in the world, they need your voice. So you need to find, like you said, how, what's that synergy? What's that collection of things that you've learned to create your personal voice? And again, I think it, for people on an encore career, that's a, it's an interesting question to keep pursuing. What's your voice and how can you share it? Yeah. And I think too, um, so much of the fear associated with it, or even the faulting, like when you screw things up, so much of that is about how you think you're being perceived by everybody else. And I can tell you that I cannot speak to your audience on this, but I think of identity as having three phases. There's this phase when you're young where your identity is attributed to you when you're very young. You're pretty, you're tall, you're handsome, you're smart, you're good at sports, you're whatever. And then most people move on to this thing where you've heard the phrase of you are the combination of the five people you spend the most time with. And I think that's where we start to look outward for who we should emulate, who we should be like. And so that's, Mm -hmm. oh, I really like this person and I spend my time with that person. So I'm going to pick up some of their traits and I listen to that podcast every single day. And so I'm probably going to pick up some Joe Rogan or whatever. And then over here I have. And so now we're looking outward for our identity. And I think. Not everybody, but I think that if you choose to continue to develop, that your identity really gets interesting when you start to look only inward, because I think that becomes infinite. There isn't some finite examples in front of you that can be confusing and contradictory. It's literally just asking. It it requires you to be able to be as objective as possible internally. But if you can learn how to look internally for your identity, there just isn't wrong answers because it's you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You, again, you have that, you're the only one that's you and that's, it's a good thing. So it, but yeah, sometimes again, I think in our second part of life, we sometimes uh, uh, start, start reflecting on those things a little bit more. And, but that's also where you can really find the value that can, you you can add in life as you become you as, and Mm -hmm. not necessarily someone else. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I sure want to thank you, Jason. This has been a wonderful conversation. I've really appreciated it. But before we go, is there anything I forgot to ask you or that you wanted to share? In the moment, I can't think of anything. I didn't have an agenda here. I just was excited to have a conversation with you. And I can tell you that you over-delivered. I've been having a blast here. Hopefully your listeners will enjoy it. And I think if you're still listening, it's probably because you love what Lynn's doing in the Encore career. And so I would say the first thing, the only thing I would have to ask is that you like and subscribe and share this show. Because if you're getting something out of this, I'm sure many other people would as well. And we'll be sharing your contact information. And if there's anything in particular you want people directed to, we'll do that in the show notes also. So again, thank you, Jason. Much appreciated. All right, Lynn. Thank you so much. Again, many thanks to Jason for this wonderful conversation and his many insights, his journey from military to corporate banking to entrepreneurship, how he found his core values and the meaning of his brand, Spear and Clover. How he helped build a business that is scalable if success comes knocking and you want to do that. And then we discuss the importance of having a purpose and maintaining a spirit of curiosity. We'll have Jason's contact information in the show notes. So please reach out to him and check him out. With an encore career, the rewards are great. And you can be creating value in the world beyond just winning that next pickleball game. You can work when you want, where you want, and you can do the work you love. So if you're ready to get started today, please contact me at lynn at lynnfreas.com or head over to my website at lynnfreas.com, check out a few podcasts, and get on the email list. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.